Bob and I had a bet last week. Bob won. He said <laughs> that's going to cut 50 basis points. I said 25 basis points. But I got to tell you, I'm shocked that they cut that much. And obviously, we had a huge melt up in the market the next day. And it just seems to me, and maybe I'm a cynic here, but do you think Jay Powell cut those rates more aggressively for political reasons? Or do you do it because he really thinks that the economy is slowing down? And man, oh man, I don't see any signs of the economy slowing down. I'm a little cynical right now. Well, the economy's not slowing down, but clearly we've been talking about this for months. The inflation rate has been moderating. We're, we're at the Fed's target, right? Where we take shelter out of the equation, we're even below their target. I think they were being restrictive. I think that's, that's why I felt pretty strongly that they were going to go 50 basis points. They were behind the curve. They had to catch up. I don't get this behind the curve. If the economy has been growing, the labor market's been tight, then why would you break something that doesn't need to be fixed? That doesn't make sense to me because clearly the higher rates hasn't slowed down the economy. Well, you know, at some point I'd like to buy a house and I called Jay Powell and I said, listen, you know, can you just lower those interest rates? Make it more attractive for me. <laughs> well, yes, he was listening to you, Chris, clearly. But, uh, you know, the labor market's not crystal clear, Rye. There's a lot of job openings where there's skilled labor is pretty hard to find. You know, there's some of these job openings that can't be filled because they can't find the skilled labor to get there. So I think he's right. He's walking a tightrope. I think he's invited the thought. I mean, clearly, you know, since the 50 basis point cut, guys, rates have gone up every day in the treasury market. You know why? Because it's inflationary. Ironically, you know, they're cutting it because inflation is going down. And what they're invertedly doing is they're going to cause more inflation, right? Because think about this, right? You have an economy that's growing. And now all of a sudden, it's like you're adding lighter fluid to a bonfire because rates going down. Chris, to your point, if you have a mortgage right now, you can refinance that mortgage, which is great. You know, that's more money to spend. But again, you have the problem here is now we might be overheating the fact that we already have a strong consumer. We already have a strong job market. So again, I'm a little suspect. Well, I'll tell you one thing I'm happy about is in the conversations I've had with my clients over the past few weeks is that they're finally starting to be happy with their bonds because they are starting to go up in price. Well, I'll tell you one thing it's for sure is the T-bill and chill strategy is over, right? I mean, they cut yeah. 50 basis points or promised cut another 50. I'm watching that money market rate drop by one to three basis point every day. And, uh, you know, the, so these treasury bonds, they got they need a place to go. And I hope they go after our portfolio. I, want, I, I love seeing things get bit up. I love panic. Well, I think there's no coincidence that the Fed cut rates and we saw a lot of money come out of those money market funds the next day uh, to the tune of like $20 billion. And again, we're still $6.3 trillion sitting in money market funds. I am going to say here now, guys, I think we have a huge, huge chance for a big melt up in the stock market because the Fed's gonna cut aggressively, money's gotta go somewhere. And we know a lot of people, the inertia of money have been sitting in those money market funds and they refuse to do anything. Now they're gonna be forced to do something. All right, well, I'm gonna say it first. I think Jerome Powell is the greatest Federal Reserve chairman in history. He, he <laughs> uh, navigated us towards this hyperinflation, got us down to a soft landing. We got the economy growing at 3% based on GDP now. Earnings are going up. We've got, uh, you know, a, a technology driven productivity roaring 2020s in front of us, guys. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan. I, you know what? I don't think you can give Jay Powell the credit for that. How about us, the American workers <laughs> that, have, uh, that have kept this economy moving? And by the way, he was late on raising interest rates, which he did it right after he was renominated. So I suspect maybe that was political. And now he's aggressively cutting because I suspect, again, he wants to get renominated. I think a slow, steady pace makes more sense here. The big risk here, mark my words, gentlemen, is we're going to see inflation rear its ugly head again next year, and the Fed's going to be on the eight ball because they've been cutting too much this year. Just my prediction. Well, you heard it here first from Ryan Payne, the working man. <laughs> Somebody's got to work around here. Everybody knows Ryan does the work. Bob and Chris relax and go on vacation as it should be. Well, and, you know, in spite of all this happy talk, um, can you believe <laughs> there are still some die hard, hard landers out there who think the economy is heading into a recession? It's not like Ryan's joining that crew, Chris. I'm getting a little nervous. <laughs> He's abandoning his ship here. As tempting <laughs> as it is, I love those hard landers, Bob. They're, they're always <laughs> on TV, creating fear, telling you that it's the, it's the worst economy ever, but I just can't do it. I think the bigger risk here is overheating the economy in the stock market. Yeah, and I mean, if that happens, I mean, there's probably a good chance that interest rates could go back up. So 
you know, this might just be the eye of the storm at this point. Well, yeah. I mean, longer term rates are starting to go up. And I think the other big message here is you've got to reallocate your portfolio, right? If you start looking at the last month, technology hasn't done anything. But meanwhile, your more interest rate sensitive sectors like industrials, uh, utilities, real estate investment trusts, financials, so many other parts of the market and the emerging markets had a big move uh, on an announcement from China adding more stimulus. So there's a lot of places to put your money right now. And my fear is what's everybody going to do? They're going to put their money back in the S&P 500, the Magnificent Seven, and they're going to miss the best buying opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, I think a lot of people, it's been lost to them that... Um... You know, the real beneficiaries of lower interest rates are small company stocks, right? Because they borrow at uh, floating rates. So they're big beneficiaries. You have the dollar is weakening because the Fed is cutting interest rates and so they're being aggressive about it. And that benefits international stocks. I mean, I, I, I think almost every portfolio, potential or, or prospective portfolio that we've reviewed in the last five years didn't have a dime in small cap value, didn't have a dime in emerging markets, didn't have a dime in pipelines. I mean, there's so much concentration in one area. Well, pop quiz, what is the all-time best performing asset class in history? Small cap value, buddy. Small cap value. No, it's true. It's So it, it's the greatest time ever to be smart, diversify. Don't just follow the herd here, the crowd. I know it's so seductive to buy what's been hot for the last couple of years, but there's one thing I can tell you about markets, guys. Things change. They change on a dime and they change unexpectedly. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life, and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob, you know, you and I were talking yesterday um, and you came up with a really good phrase. But of course, I made it better because I ran it through ChatGPT. Um, we talked about how human nature's tyranny sabotages people's ability to invest their money. And it's kind of uncanny, but it seems like people in mass tend to want to make the wrong decision at the wrong time, like all the time. So I thought we could talk a little bit today about how, as an investor, a lot of times you're your own worst enemy when it comes to creating wealth over time. And maybe we talk about some of the reasons why we don't always make the best investment decisions. Well, you know what, guys, I, I look at it like eating unhealthy food. You know, it's great to eat that tasty cake, but you know what, long term, it offers no nutritional value and doesn't do anything for your longevity. You know, some of these like high flying stocks are the same way. Yeah, but Chris, I mean, it's tasty cake. How could you not want to have a tasty cake? <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, marketing works, but you know, it works because human nature doesn't change. I mean, we have this gigantic fear of the unknown, right? We have this fear of failure. Uh, we fear losses, you know, more than we appreciate gains. And, you know, then you got that fear of greed. I mean, it's just, we see it all the time. Hey guys, a year ago, we did our fireside chat because people were scared to death. The market was collapsing. It was the end of the world as we know it. And here we are at all time record highs. Yeah. But it's interesting, right? Because it's always like whatever the message is in mass, like, oh, 
you know, having money in cash now or money markets at 5%, uh, that's a good position. That's a good place for your money. Whereas in reality, it wasn't. Even over the last two years, when you're getting your 5%, when you factor it in taxes and inflation, you really had no return. Whereas Ed, you put your money in the stock market, you diversified your money in a tax-free bond portfolio, that actually would have done better. Um, but, you know, people tend to go with what seems like common sense, but a lot of times it's not. Well, they want that certainty and, it, and you never have any certainty, right? The only thing certain about investing, uh, about business, about the economy is the uncertainty of it. And, you know, when they feel that they have certainty, then they feel like they have to act. And unfortunately, they act on impulse, right? So it's, you know, all of a sudden, I want to own a stock name NVIDIA. I don't know what they do. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I just know everybody's talking about it. And, um, you know, I mean, it's I, and even if we do own it already, I need to own more. I mean, it's, just, yeah. it's, it's, it's so sad. Well, you know, I've had this conversation so many times over the last 12 months with my clients. You know, they'll come to me, they'll say, hey, Chris, you know, you always said I only need like a 5% rate of return on my money. Well, guess what? I'm getting in my money market. It's guaranteed. <laughs> I said, yeah, but the problem is it's guaranteed for a short period of time. You need a 5% return over a 40, 50 year period. Yeah. And, you know, no one seems to have that foresight, right? We've been talking for months about how the Fed's going to cut interest rates. But it was so hard to move people out of their money market fund. In fact, they're still not moving out. And now they're like a deer in headlights. And I suspect what's going to happen here is a lot of money now is going to come out of these money market funds impulsively, Bob, like you just said. And where's that money going to go? It's probably going to go to the hottest part of the market, which is already bid up, right? Like the S&P 500, which you're inadvertently buying more NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple. And these stocks aren't cheap. So, you know, and then you, what you have is a risk of creating a bubble and a bubble bursting, but it just seems like a domino effect of money tends to always go to the wrong place at the wrong time. And it might be right for a short period of time, but it ends up usually not working out. And I find that so interesting. Yeah, you know, I've learned over my career, guys, and, you know, working in big corporations and, you know, running small businesses, that there is no institutional memory. I mean, we're all doomed to failure. It's like we have to... <laughs> Everybody has to touch the electric fence once. <laughs> uh, you know, you just can't be educated about it. And it, it, it really, it is kind of frustrating when you see that because of that tyranny of human nature, we're, we're just, you know, pre-wired, we're pre-ordained to have to make these mistakes, you know, to the detriment of our net worth and our families. Well, it's like Voltaire said, you know, history doesn't repeat itself. Human beings do. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so true. Wow, Chris, Voltaire. <laughs> Who said this podcast was uh, so highbrow? Well, you know, if you go back to it, guys, I mean, the, the whole purpose of the A to B process was because of that tyranny of human nature, right? I, I would build portfolios, you know, as a young broker. And as soon as something went down, people would bail out, sell and transfer their account. I go, well, this is a good productive use of my time. So what you have to do is you have to attach your emotional resolve, you know, to achieving a goal, right? You know, educating your child, your grandchild is a goal. So it's easy to, to attach a specific strategy to that knowing that there's an end in mind and then something that, you know, you just can't bypass. So it's, it's all about controlling your emotions. And that's why we use all these different devices and planning, you know, to help people get there. And in hindsight, it looks simple, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah. What I find interesting though, is it seems like markets always take you to the brink one way or the other, right? It's like, because we kind of oscillate between, when we're fearful, we're really fearful. Um, and when we get greedy, it's like that fear of missing out is just so urgent. But you always find this like the darkest hours right before the dawn. And I think last year is a great example of that, right? I mean, if people forget, by the time October, November rolled around last year, man, oh man, I mean, the sentiment was so negative. Um, the news was so negative. And there's just this big fear. You know, people are, were calling me saying like, this market's not doing anything. Um, and literally, I hadn't done anything for like, I don't know, 12 months plus, right? That's how impatient we are as investors. You know, can we look at a different strategy? Can we do something else? And to your point, that was right on the cusp of the market going straight up. And you always hear like, well, I don't see anything good going on. I don't know what the catalyst is going to be. And that's kind of the point, right? Markets move on surprises. They, they don't move based on what we can anticipate. And that's such a dangerous strategy. Well, it's like, right, you just said it yourself. I mean, there's people sitting in money markets, even as rates are coming down in front of their face, but they still hang on to those money markets. I mean, it's human nature that markets go to the brink. Well, guys, you know, it's the old Bobism. Why are there unexpected moves in the market? Because they're unexpected. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Everything is already known. Everybody knows the same thing, right? We read the same things. We come to the same conclusions at the same time. Um, it's, it's all the tyranny of that human nature. And, you know, you just, sometimes you just have to check yourself, right? When you, when you're convinced of something, you know, yeah. you're probably wrong. <laughs> You know, you know, it's I kind of like, ironically, you're talking about like, you look at China right now, right? The China market has done horrible and you only heard negative news about China. Then all of a sudden, as we're recording this, look at this today, they're coming out this big stimulus package and the market's up 7% on the snap of a finger, but nobody predicted that. Nobody said that was going to happen. And now, you know, there's this big fear. If China's market starts to recover, that's going to cause a lot more inflation. Um, so it's just, it's incredible. You know, you can't really predict these things. You can't anticipate them. I always say anticipation is like the worst investment strategy. Well, it's funny you say that, right? This morning, I got a text from one of my clients at 7 a.m. asking about if, if we should be involved in these emerging markets or not. And uh, <laughs> you know, I was happy to say, yes, you've invested those. And, you know, not only that, you've been invested for years. You know why? Because we've sat on that emerging market fund for years and it did nothing. And then all of a sudden it does something. We got in early. Well, first of all, I have to disagree. It pays a 4% dividend that's been growing every year. And uh, we've been averaging in over time. And, you know, remember, guys, wealth creation is not about relative performance. It's about owning the most shares before it goes up. So your client, Chris, should have been screaming at you for the last couple of years, buying more shares. He who or she who has the most shares wins, right? That's the problem. <laughs> well, you know, guys, it, this is what it all comes down to. It's not called rational exuberance, right? Uh, it's called irrational exuberance. You get it on the upside, you get it on the downside. You know, as an investor, it's your job to put a governor on those emotions. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob. Half of the vehicles sold in China in July were electric vehicles, according to Ristart Energy meaning gasoline use may plateau sooner than expected. In 2023, China installed 62% of the world's non-hydroelectric renewable projects like solar, wind. It built more solar in one year than the U.S. has in its entire history. Man, oh man, China is way ahead on the uh, alternative energy bandwagon. Well, it really looks that way. You also are the leading exporter of EVs around the world. Of course, We've never seen one, you know, they, all the tariffs we put on China products, we've never seen an electric vehicle. Uh, it's, it surprises all my clients when I tell them that they're the leader in the world because no one's ever seen one. But think about it, guys, China's in a recession. I mean, they're all hosted in a depression, a real estate depression, and they're still growing, right? Not only are they building these non-hydroelectric renewable projects, but they're also building tons of coal plants, coal powered plants. So. You, know, you better keep an eye out on inflation. I think China's making a comeback here. I guess I should tell Ryan that I spent some of our corporate capital to buy apartments in Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty cheap, Chris. <laughs> I think you'd lose a lot of popularity with our clients, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Payne goes in ghost cities in China. Yes. That's right. You heard it here first. All right, Chris. 72% growth in copper demand projected by BHP between 2021 and 2050 due to artificial intelligence data center growth. Man, oh man, these AI data centers, they're going to use a lot of commodities. Yeah. And, you know, copper's uh, really popular for its uh, conductive properties. All the wiring that's used throughout data centers, uh, you know, is, is what makes everything work. Um, and as a matter of fact, that I remember you telling me back in the day, your father, our grandfather, who was a plumber, you know, he used to go and pipe houses and show up the next day and all the copper would be gone because people would come and steal it uh, and sell it because it was so valuable. It's just as valuable as it is today. Yeah, they've been trying to replace it ever since, Chris. They tried stainless steel for a while, then they went to PVC pipe. It's, you know, <laughs> copper is just a, uh, a, a terrific metal, um, but it's, when it's in demand, a lot of people steal it. People don't realize that Bob could actually uh, do the plumbing in your house, but uh, you could never get him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right. I'm, I'm having nightmares now. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob. According to Morningstar, during the first half of 2024, only 18.2% of actively managed mutual funds and exchange traded funds that have cap weighted S&P 500 index as their benchmark have outperformed it. Right, really surprising. Managers never outperform. That's down from 19.8% for all of 2023. The problem is the prospect for active managers are particularly handicapped considering the first half of this year, 60% of the return in the S&P 500 
came from seven stocks, those magnificent seven stocks. Hard to be a money manager. Well, it's impossible to be a money manager. I've been studying these statistics forever. It's why we're all index funds for a reason. But it's just incredible. It, it, they can't do it. It's impossible to do. And it's been proven. And it's not just the S&P. It's every index. So, you know, these CFAs, they waste all this time studying balance sheets and income schedules just so they can charge you a fee to help you underperform what's free. Yeah, and ah. just when you thought 500 stocks was diversified. <laughs> All right, guys, well, another great show. If you loved episode 174, our Pain Points of Wealth, we hope you did, please give us that five-star rating on iTunes, on Spotify. You can subscribe on both channels. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can like this episode, subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell, be updated of all our new content. Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Pain Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 